I'm back. Mr. Clark's back. Time to take a look at 17.4. The Vietnam War ends, the effects of the war. You can see the imagery there, the newspaper headline from the Albuquerque, New Mexico Journal. Some of the objectives that we're looking at here is we'll kind of assess Nixon's new approach to the war and explain why protests continued in the United States. We'll explain what led to the Paris Peace Accords and why South Vietnam eventually would fall to the communists. We'll look at the long-term impact of Vietnam on the United States as well. Question one, why was Nixon's goal of peace with honor so difficult to achieve? A peace with honor was difficult to achieve because the United States and the North Vietnamese refused to compromise on several points. In order for a successful agreement to occur, and one of which both sides are happy, there has to be some give and take on both sides, and that was obviously not occurring between the North Vietnamese government and the United States. As many thought that the North Vietnamese believed they had an advantage at this point in time. They knew the United States' willingness to continue to fight was waning, and they knew if they waited it out, they might be able to get a better settlement. Secondly, the United States wanted communist troops out of South Vietnam. The North Vietnamese refused to leave until their conditions were met. They wanted American troops to withdraw. They wanted the Viet Cong to be represented in the government of South Vietnam. So basically their goal is to have all of Vietnam communists to kind of sum that up. Two, what message did Nixon's actions such as Vietnamization, as well as his secret bombings of the Ho Chi Minh Trail send to communists? The bombings and the Vietnamization process, suggesting the United States did not truly wish to withdraw from the conflict in Vietnam, but were kind of transitioned into a war in which the South Vietnamese would fight. The United States involvement would continue through aid to South Vietnam or by deploying or, or by destroying supply lines to the Viet Cong. Three, how is Vietnamization supposed to work? Well, the United States was supposed to provide training, technical support, and supplies to the North, North Vietnamese, uh, to the, which should be the South Vietnamese fighting force to help defeat the North Vietnamese communists. Instead, Nixon widened the war uh, to uh, bombing Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, he wanted to, if you remember the Ho Chi Minh Trail, we looked at that earlier, basically ran through Cambodia and Laos, and the United States was really hesitant to hit the supply line that was resupplying the North Vietnamese troops because uh, we would be then widening the war into Laos and Cambodia. Uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail supplied the Viet Cong and allowed them to travel without retaliation along the trail. Four, what emotionally charged language that Richard Nixon used to persuade people that going into camp Cambodia was the right thing to do. He compared America to a pitfall, a helpless giant, and he asserted that if America did not act, the forces of totalitarianism and anarchy would threaten free nations throughout the world. Now, once we heard that uh, Nixon was bombing uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail and expanding the war into Cambodia and Laos, many Americans hit the protest scene Protests began to increase in nature, and some of the protests really escalated in 1970, in May of 1970, on the Kent State campus in Ohio. Uh, they were protesting the escalation of the war in Cambodia and Laos. Student protesters burned down the ROTC building on the campus on May 2nd. ROTC, ROTC is the group that kind of blends college students and those who might be in the National Guard or kind of uh, training, kind of military members kind of a liaison to the regular military. On May 4th, the Ohio governor ordered the National Guard to the campus to break up protesters. Nobody knows for certain, but as you can see there, basically you have the military kind of in lines there and somebody opened fire and nobody knows that if anybody ordered it. It seems there were no orders given. Somebody might have made a mistake and opened fire, but when a line of troops has one person fired, everybody opens fire. And so what they did is they basically fired into a, a crowd of protesters they fired 67 rounds in 13 seconds, killing four and injuring nine others. You see the photograph on the left. On the right side is a horrified, this became like a front page photograph on newspapers and magazines across the country. This young lady uh, looking at one of the deceased 
members here of the protesters. You can see the four who died on the right, you know, just regular you know, college students, you know, probably not all that older than most of you. And uh, they became uh, kind of a sad reminder of what can happen in a situation like this. To analyze the photographs here, you can see the photo probably caused an emotional reaction in people. It showed a young person being killed by the National Guard. It would cause people to distrust authority figures as well in the military, even a little bit more so. They were supposed to protect citizens, not kill them in this situation. And of course, this turned a lot of the Americans who were maybe indifferent or neutral against the war and in favor of some of the protesters. <clears throat> Okay, seven white American soldiers fire at civilians in the village of Mylai. Was his action justified? <clears throat> American soldiers who were fired were on the edge because some of the Viet Cong at that point in time were posing as civilians. They didn't know who to trust. And so they opened fire on innocent Vietnamese civilians. This became known as the Mylai Massacre. The Mai Lai Massacre may have started as a legitimate military action to find enemy soldiers, but the situation quickly spiraled out of control. Uh, many soldiers refused to fire on the civilians, and at least one soldier tried to stop the massacre. So it must have been clear at the time that the person who ordered the shooting, Lieutenant Calais' unit, was doing something morally wrong. The government initially covered it up, as well as some of these images that you see here. But it did eventually come out, and Lieutenant Kelly was convicted of 22 murders, as you see here in the headline of the Washington Post newspaper. So the Vietnam War was definitely filled with a lot of negativity, a lot of lies and deception, which kind of added you know, fuel to the fire. It was kind of another unfortunate aspect of Vietnam. It would be bad enough if we just lost the war on paper, but some of these other secondary things were terrible as well. Okay, moving on to another scandal during this period of time of a whistleblower, uh, Daniel Ellsberg. You can see some of the imagery here. The Pentagon papers were classified documents, and Daniel Ellsberg was a Pentagon employee, and what he did is he made copies and smuggled out classified documents. These documents then revealed when they were given to the New York Times in the Washington Post, that the government had been deliberately misleading the American public with statements on the Vietnam War. And this is true in both the Johnson and Nixon administrations. The New York Times published excerpts from the Pentagon Papers, further wither withering away any support that was left for the war. Nine, some people consider Richard Nixon to be a deceitful politician, evaluate this statement. Well, Nixon had promised Vietnamization, but instead expanded the war. Nixon hid important facts about American involvement in the Vietnam War from American citizens, and these facts came to light in the Pentagon Papers that were later on published. This is not even taken into consideration. A bigger scandal that's going to hit the Nixon administration that we'll be looking at in the uh, days and weeks to come, which is the Watergate scandal, where he actually had authorized a break-in into the Democratic National Headquarters in 1972 to help him win the presidential election. So obviously the evidence against Nixon certainly does prove that he was a deceitful politician. Ten, what events led the United States to sign the Paris Accords? A growing dissent at home and discontent was the, the war is very unpopular. A 1971 poll showed that two-thirds of the American people opposed the war by then. Nixon was afraid that without public support, he would lose political power. So he was determined to find a way to end the conflict before he had to run, uh, run for re-election in 1972. What happened in October 1972? The United States and North Vietnam, North Vietnam came to a tentative terms on a peace settlement. Now that the Vietnam War was somewhat behind us, the results of the 1972 presidential election are going to turn out in the favor of Nixon. Nixon was reelected by an overwhelming margin over a Democratic anti-war candidate, George McGovern. McGovern's candidacy lost steam after Nixon announced his peace settlement with North Vietnam. So really, the Democrats were set up for failure. They had a candidacy in George McGovern. It was primarily on an anti-war end the war movement. The war had come to an end prior to the voting that would take place in 1972. So the rationale for voting for McGovern was kind of thrown out the door. 
<clears throat> 13, who won the Vietnam War? The Viet Cong and North Vietnamese won the war after American troops withdrew from Vietnam. South Vietnam and the ARVN fell to the communists. Although the United States forces were not present when the, uh, South Vietnam fell, the United States had supported the losing side of the war. Saigon fell and South Vietnamese surrendered on April 30th, 1975. What were the costs of the Vietnam War? 58,220 Americans lost their lives. There's a Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. It lists all the names of those who had died. 300,000 American injuries, 75,000 permanently disabled veterans, 766 prisoners of war, which 114 of which died in captivity. Financial cost over $200 billion, or the equivalency of over $1 trillion today. Approximately 4 million Southeast Asians lost their lives as well. So not only was all of Vietnam communist after the Vietnam War was over, we saw a similar situation take place in Cambodia, the communist government that took control of Cambodia towards the end of the Vietnam War, as we fear the domino effect kind of was moving forward as Cambodia fell to communism. Considering the effects of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, should the United States have continued the invasion of Cambodia? Well, the communist Khmer Rouge regime led to the deaths of 2 million Cambodians in labor camps, and they basically would amount it to a genocide there. The United States could have continued their invasion of Cambodia, may have saved you know, some 2 million Cambodian lives. You could certainly argue that it would have been worthwhile to go into Cambodia. However, the United States at that point in time had less patience. Many Americans were... I uh, guess concerned about continuing to fight there. Seventeen, however, Vietnam War veterans received when they returned home from the war. Unfortunately, they were not met with parades or a hero's welcome. Like many of the previous veterans of foreign wars, there were no parades. They were kind of looked down upon because so many people hated the Vietnam War and really did not treat them with the respect they deserved. They didn't decide to go to war. They just did their duty and served in the war. What other issues did veterans face? If we look at 18, thousands of veteran, veterans suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder from the war, and we knew very little about it back then. Additionally, to the you know, psychological issues, Thousands suffered from long-term effects from the chemical weapons that were used during the war and the physical handicaps and limitations from the loss of limbs. 19. Why was the War Powers Act passed in Congress? Many believe that the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that gave Lyndon Baines Johnson unchecked war powers was one of the biggest mistakes of the war. The War Powers Act limited the power of the president to wage war and restored more of the checks and balances to fighting a war. This act gave the president the power to commit American troops, but they must report to Congress within 48 hours as to why the troops are deployed. The president must receive congressional approval within 60 days to keep the troops deployed. Twenty, what economic challenges did the United States face during the mid-1970s in the aftermath of the Vietnam War? Unemployment increased from four percent in 1970 to nearly 10 percent five years later in 1975 inflation reached 10 percent by 1975 the 1973 middle eastern oil embargo led to an increase in gas prices from 40 cents a gallon to a dollar 20 by 1980 and government spending doubled from 1970 to 1975 severely impacting our uh, national debt and then the lesson reflection what were some of the most significant long-term effects of the vietnam war the Vietnam War affected the foreign policy of the United States for years to come. First, because the United States was afraid to that any foreign conflict could be labeled the new Vietnam if it wasn't going well. They also realized that wars would now be covered on TV. In addition, the Vietnam War was enormously expensive and damaged the American economy. And every war since has been viewed in the context of the light of the Vietnam War. Hopefully you enjoyed our ongoing discussion here of the Vietnam War understand the consequences of fighting that war and how it's impacted society moving forward. Until next time, Mr. Clark is.
out.